أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين ولا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين وحجته في العالمين روح وأرواح العالمين لتراب مقدمه فداء واللعن الدائم على أعدائهم وغاصب حقوقهم وجاحد مناقبهم ومنكر فضائلهم من الآن إلى أبد الآبدين My very respected viewers Assalamu alaikum May peace be unto you I beseech fondly that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant all of us good health in Iman and faith and piety and may he enable us to endear good character and show good deeds and inshallah tabarak wa ta'ala and serve him and serve all of humanity especially our neighbors our relatives our families I beseech Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala most sincerely that may he forgive us and forgive our forefathers and our families and may he bestow upon us the intercession and shafa'a of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam and his impeccable and infallible and majestic household salamullahi alayhim Allahumma salla ala muhammadin wa ala muhammad Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Arham al-Rahimin, Ya Arham al-Rahimin, Ya Arham al-Rahimin, Ya Mahmud bihaq Muhammad, wa Ya Ali bihaq Ali, wa Ya Fatir al-Samawat wal-Ardina bihaq Fatima al-Zahra, wa Ya Muhsin bihaq al-Hasan, wa Ya Qadim al-Ihsan bihaq al-Husayn. Nas'aluk wa nuqsimuk, salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad, wa ajjil li waliyyik al-Faraj, اللهم عجل لوليك الفرج اللهم عجل لوليك الفرج اللهم عجل لوليك الفرج اللهم عجل لوليك الفرج وبلغه منا تحية وسلاما وزدنا بذلك يا رب إكراما اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد Okay my dear brethren on this uh, it's a Monday afternoon here in California I'm presenting to you another speech on the topic of Imamah and the notion and dogma of Imama in Shiism compared to the Omari school of thought. We have been fo focusing in the last four speeches and we will focus in this current lecture as well in examining the dogma of Imama in the Omari tradition. In the Omari tradition there is a void of any instructions from Allah any inculcations from the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, any sort of directives in Quran or Sunnah as how to Ummah is supposed to determine who its legitimate leader is after the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So they maintain the theologians of the Omri denomination, they insist and they maintain that there is no instruction from Allah or Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam specifically on the question of Imam. Except in general terms as how um, that we can deduce as uh, from these general principles, general principles as uh, where the Imam should come from, from which families, from which lineages, from which tribes, and what are our obligations towards the Imam. But as far as the question goes, who is supposed to rule the Muslims? That has not been determined neither by Quran nor by Sunnah. So what are the means? How is the Ummah to know who is the legitimate leader of the Muslims after the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Because there's no shortage of people who aspire to be Imams, who aspire to be rulers, and who would love to sit in the position of power in the position of commanding and prohibiting Muslims and administering their affairs. How would the Ummah determine and establish who is the legitimate Imam? So as far as Quran and Sunnah goes, there is no principle in that regard. However, the Imams have, the theologians of the Ummari scholarship, they have 
preferred and offered certain principles by which the imama of a person is legitimized and his imama is in a shara'i way, in a religious way, by shara'i we means before Allah and Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in accord to the laws of Islam. An imama is legitimized and actualized and is, and is recognized. And these three manners, there are three manners as such, and these three manners are one, by the bay'ah, by pledge of allegiance from any number, from any number, this number is not determined, from the people of Ahlul Halli Wal Aqd, people of binding and unbinding, people of solution and and um, compact and and uh, and pact. Who are the people of binding and unbinding? I'll I'll delve into that in, in a moment. The second manner by which an imam. Uh, becomes an imam and his imam is established is if the previous imam, the previous caliph, the previous ruler appoints a successor and an heir. So such a person, he inherits the imama from the one who was before him. The third way, which is a shara'i way, which is a legitimate way, a person becomes imam and his imama indeed becomes binding for all Muslim individuals all over the world is by the means of the sword. If a certain person comes and overpowers the Muslims and he puts the sword anybody who opposes him and he, no matter how much carnage, how much barbarity he creates, such a person, if he claims to be because he has overwhelmed the Muslims and he has defeated all his um, opponents, if he de decides to be a caliph, then he is indeed a caliph. Even if nobody does bay'ah with him. Even if nobody has appointed him. The previous imam has not appointed him, appointed him. Rather, the previous imam was dispatched and liquidated by his sword. Such a person becomes imam. In other words, in the Omri denomination, you cannot conceive a way by which a person becomes caliph in an illegitimate manner. As... as as long as he's able to hold the throne, if he succeeds in holding the throne, no matter by which way he becomes caliph, he becomes caliph. So the, the, may, the ways and means and fashions by which a caliph can legitimately become a caliph are many. And I cannot conceive of any way that would be illegitimate as long as he's able to seize the power. If he's not able to seize power, of course, then he will never become caliph. Once he seizes power, doesn't matter if he's degenerate, if he's corrupt, he's a vile human being, does not matter. He becomes a, a caliph and his imam is binding and obedience to him is compulsory and opposition to him is prohibited in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now let me show you some texts because some of you may think that I'm being too overdramatic and perhaps the Omri denomination have not asserted such things. So I'm going to be brief in this regard, and if anyone um, wants to uh, delve into these matters with more uh, depth and uh, in more detail, then I refer them to my lectures in Arabic or Persian uh, on the topic. This book is as Sawaiq al muhriqah fi al ala ahl al bidai wa zandaqah ta'alifu. Ibn Hajar al-Makki al-Haythami, one of the foremost respected theologians and jurists of the Omri denomination, he has uh, written this book in um, refutation to the arguments of Shia on the question of Imam. This book is published in uh, 2008 in Al-Mansura in Egypt. Let's go to page number 57. Al-Muqaddimah al-Thalitha, the third prologue. Al-Imamatu tathbutu bin-nassim min al-Imami ala istikhlaafi wahidin min ahliha. Imama is legitimately proved, leadership is legitimately proved for a person who otherwise carries the um, requirements to be an Imam. 
What are the requirements to be an Imam? Requirements to be an Imam, he has to be from Quraysh, from the tribe of Quraysh. He does not have to be a knowledgeable person. He does not have to be pious. He, none of those are required because if a person is ignorant and he's not a mujtahid, or if a person is degenerate and he has a, a perfidious character, such a person's imam is indeed legitimate. As, 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 uh, as long as he's able to hold the throne. Um, so one way would be the previous imam, the previous leader, the pre pre previous king or caliph would appoint an heir. And in this, uh, in such a case, the succeeding person the, to, to whom the throne has been bequeathed, he would become immediately a legitimate imam. Or if the individuals from the community of binding and unbinding, Ahlul Halli Wal Aqdi, the people of solution and pact, who are the people of solution and pact or solution and contract? These are uh, celebrities of the Ummah, these are influential individuals in the Ummah, they could be leaders of the tribes. They could be people of knowledge. They could be merchants with immense amount of money and capital, or they could be people who enjoy the loyalty of militiamen and armed groups. So seniors in the community, if they, and it, and now with respect to seniors, so now let's examine one thing here and uh, pay attention. We are not talking about democracy here, that every individual has a right to vote, and as long as the majority chooses a person, no. We're not talking about the majority. We are not talking about the vote. We're not talking about the election. We are talking about a, an undetermined number of people from the community of binding and unbinding, influential members of the society. Now, how many of them, the majority of them, if they agree upon a certain person to be the caliph or the ruler, no. That's not a requirement. The majority of the influential uh, community leaders in the Muslim Ummah, their majority appoint a person to become an Imam, then he becomes imam, an Imam. That's another requirement. Half of them, 40% of them, 30% of them, no. There is no requirement into that regard. As long as a, a certain number of them, that could be as few as one, as few as two, as few as three people. If three tribal leaders, there are thousands of tribes in the Ummah, and there are thousands of ulama, hundreds of thousands of scholars in the Ummah, and there are hundreds of thousands of jurists and theologians in the Ummah, and there are thousands of army generals in the Ummah. As, as long as two or three of them appoint a person as caliph, he becomes caliph. That's it. So this, and then... Of course, if he can hold power, if he, another guy comes and kills him, then that's it. He's gone. So this makes it impossible for any person to be a legitimate caliph. How could you become an illegitimate caliph? Because no matter what, you will find a couple people. You will find three, four people from the influ influential leaders of the Muslims. A, a, a couple of chiefs of tribes or maybe a couple of militia leaders or a couple of jurists. There are a dime a dozen. So you can find them who would do bay'ah to you. And you'll become a leader. You'll become caliph. And the important thing is, none of this has been enunciated in the Quran or Sunnah. These are just made up things. These are just made up theology, fabricated theology, and attributed to Islam in order to legitimize all the caliphs that who, have, who have been in Islamic history. So none of them ever uh, can be uh, illegitimate or illegal or unlawful. Okay, so this is the first manner. And then he says, Or there are other ways. So the other two ways he does not mention. He just mentions the first way, which is through bayah. Written by Abu Hassan Yahya ibn Abi Khair ibn Salim al Imrani al Shafi al Yamani. Is passed away at year 558 Hijri. 
is volume number 12, published by Darul Minhaj. And on page number 10, فَأَمْ فَإِنَّ الْإِمَامَةُ لَا تَنْعَقِدُ إِلَّا بِأَنْ يَسْتَخْلِفَهُ الْإِمَامُ الَّذِي كَانَ قَبْلَهُ Okay. Imama is not legitimized except these the, uh, through these following ways. One, way one, manner one, fashion one, process number one. The previous Imam, he bequeaths Imama to someone. He has a, he has a crown prince and he appoints the crown prince as Imam. Then he becomes Imam. Let me zoom in. أو بأن لم يكن هناك إمام فيق فيقهر الناس فيقهر الناس بالغلبة. Or if there is no imam, there is no imam, and a person comes and overpowers the people. A person, bloodthirsty dictator, he commits uh, massacres and he commits um, creates uh, carnages and he. And everybody has to submit to him. And then such a person becomes caliph. And it, now he mentions that if there is no imam, and then he comes and overpowers people. But that's not true. Because we know throughout history, there have been imams. There have been caliphs. Like Banu Umayyah. They were, in, they were, uh, they were fully... Uh, they were, the Khilafah was fully in action and effective throughout Islamic lands. And then Bani Abbas came and overthrew them and uh, Tabi'een and uh, Tabi'i Tabi'een and uh, jurists, they all did bay'ah to Bani Abbas. So if another person invades, if a person rises up from the public, although it's haram, although it's prohibited to rise up with the sword against the Umri, uh, viewpoint against the uh, ruler it's haram now if you commit this haram and you have certain followers who are willing to die for you uh, and they're willing to sacrifice limb and life for you now you uh, go and overpower the caliph and you kill him and you take over the government you become a legitimate imam that's it okay well so the <laughs> So the first manner is succession. The second manner is through the sword. The third manner is The third manner is that the people of binding and unbinding, the community of influential uh, leaders of the society, they agree to your imama. And then he says, He says that, Consensus of everybody. That's not required. The, 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 each individual Muslim, their their opinion, their vote. What do they think? Whether should we choose this person or Imam? That is not a requirement. Because they are muqallids. They are people of emulation. They are muqallids. They do taqlid of ulama. If ulama agree, and now it's not necessary all of ulama agree on a person. No, that's never going to happen. That all of ulama agree, even if you're talking about Umari ulama, they will agree on this person to be imam. No, that's not going to happen. There will be disagreements. Majority, it's impossible to gather all of the ulama of the ummah to create a majority to do an election amongst the ulama. Now, what is the definition of ulama? There is no definition of that either. So these are all arbitrary rules made up. So that's not required. قال الشيخ أبو إسحاق في التنبيه في التنبيه ولا ينعقد إلا بعقد جماعة من أهل الحل والعقد ومقتضى كلامي أن أقلهم ثلاثة. So our Sheikh has said that أهل الحل والعقد people of binding and binding should should uh, appoint someone as caliph, he becomes caliph. So the first manner was what? Was uh, succession, then to overpower with the sword. The third way is with the, through the people of binding and unbinding. So he, this guy has said, Abu Ishaq, in his book, at tanmi he said that Ahlul Halli Wal Aqd, they should appoint a person, an imam, he becomes imam. Now this means that Ahlul Halli wal because it's a plural, plural uh, uh, figure. 
Now, plural, pl plural means in Arabic, there's singular, there's a uh, dual, and there's plural. So, so plural, the minimum is three. The minimum requirement is three. The minimum requirement, if three scholars, three uh, military leaders, or three merchants, or a combination, they call a person an imam, he becomes an imam. وقال القاضي أبو الفتوح ينعقد بعقد واحد من أهل الحل والعقد. and others have said no, there is no, there is no requirement of three people, even of one person. one sheikh from one tribe, one chief from one tribe, or a certain merchant does bay'ah with you. you become an imam, and now it becomes obligatory for everyone to obey you, and pay their taxes to you, and for everyone to fight under your banner. And it becomes haram for everyone to oppose you. Okay, there are many, many references in this regard. We are not, I'm not going to take your time to keep showing you the same material, the same principles from various books. So, uh, it won't be bad. Let me show you some assertions from uh, Ahmad ibn Hanbal. That would be actually beneficial. This is Kitab al-Ahkam al-Sultaniyyah by Abil Hassan Ali ibn Muhammad ibn Habib al-Mawardi. He passed away at year 450 after the Hijrah. This book was published by Kuwait University in the year 1989. Okay. So he talks about Imama. This whole book is about politics. And then um, he narrates from Ahmad ibn Hanbal. Page number 20, Ahmad ibn Hanbal. says that 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 there is no requirement of alim that the imam should be alim he should be mujtahid or he should be a god-fearing person a kind person and a, a person of good attributes no that's not a requirement because ahmad has stated ahmad ibn hanbal has stated any person who comes and overwhelms the Muslims. He defeats them. He defeats all his opposition. He puts them to the sword. And he becomes Khalifa. And people call him Amir al-Mu'mineen. Then it becomes religiously prohibited. It becomes religiously, not as a matter of prudence, no. As we Shia say, as a matter of prudence, no, this indeed becomes the law of Islam. It becomes haram for any person who believes in Allah and in the Day of Judgment. That he may go to sleep at his bed and he does not believe that this person is my Imam. It becomes prohibited, it becomes haram religiously that any person in the Islamic community, in the Islamic nation, that he goes to bed at night and, his, and it's not his belief that this person who just came and created carnage and created barbarity and shed rivers of blood. Such a person is not my imam. Barran kana aw fajira. Doesn't matter this new caliph who has committed massacres. If he is a virtuous person or no, a very degenerate, perfidious person, a person of indeed very low character, does not matter. فَهُوَ أَمِيرُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Such a person is the king of the believers. Such a person is the king of the believers. You have to support him. Now, this matter that, that a ruler does not, regardless of his character, that how low his character is, how vile his character is, how repulsive his character is, as how transgressive and abusive he is, he is your Imam, and you have to follow him, and you have to obey him, and you have to support him. This is not just the opinion of Ahmad. The Umaris have attributed numerous hadith to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in this regard. Let me show you some hadith from the book of a Muslim.
Okay, we are looking at Sahih Muslim, volume number five, published by Darus Salam. <laughs> Darus Salam, obviously, is funded by Saudi Arabia. This is the book of leadership, Kitabul Imara. Book, book of Imara, leadership, or Imama, you can call it, same thing. The book of leadership. And you can go in Muslim, in Bukhari, in Buh Al Bukhari it's called the book of Al Ahkam, the book of uh, um, jurisprudence, judgeship. And in Bukhari, in Muslim, it's Kitab Al Amara. And you, ha you can look there. There is no formula from the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, no instruction as who the Imam after him would be. And what are the ways, the means by which a person becomes a legitimate Imam? There is no, nothing in that regard. However, there are lots of ahadith. Lots of ahadith that if a, your imam is a person you dislike, is a person of very low character, is very abusive, still you have to support him, you have to obey him. Uh, and there are many chapters in this regard. Just, I've just chosen one or two chapters, but you can look at the many chapters that are in, uh, in Bukhari and Muslim. Babu al-amri bil sabri inda in the ظلم بِوِلَاتِ وَاسْتِعْثَارِهِمْ Chapter, the command to be patient in the face of oppressive rulers and their selfishness. Now, selfishness, istighthar is not selfishness. Istighthar is to abuse and appropriate your belongings, your rights, your income, what you are entitled to, to himself. That's what in, actually istighthar means. If I, if I illegitimately prioritize myself over you and appropriate your belongings and your rights to my, uh, to my interests, that is istighthar. So uh, the title of the Muslim is that you have to be patient. No, it's not that you have to be patient. Actually, Muslim is being uh, a little uh, de deceitful here. The hadith indicates that you have to support him, such a ruler. It was narrated from Usaid ibn Hudayr that a man from among the Ansar took the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam aside and said, will you not appoint me as you appointed? So and so. So, Ala tasta'amilni kama sta'amalta fulanan. So he was saying about uh, appointing some uh, him as a governor or as a person appoint him to. Uh, collect uh, taxes, zakat. So at the time, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would always appoint his emissaries to collect taxes of zakat from various tribes. Or he would, um, he would appoint uh, leaders for different uh, regions during his lifetime. And that's very interesting that he always appointed leaders of the armies. He appointed uh, his emissaries for various um, missions appointed people to collect zakat, appointed people to be rulers of various provinces. However, when he dies, he neither appoints anybody to, to succeed him, nor he gives any formula, any instruction as how Muslims would determine who the imam after him would be. Rather, what he states are all these ahadith that do not make sense. That are just... Um, very make make it very convenient and make it very easy for tyrants, for despots, for bloodthirsty, barbaric rulers to be to extract any kind of any kind of um, benefit and interest from the Muslim community. So this person asked the Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam to appoint me as a governor or appoint me as a person to collect zakat. He said, you will encounter. Now, now this answer, this hadith is very strange because the answer does not really correspond. It does not really jibe in with the question. The answer is something else. The question is something, the answer is something else. Okay. He said, you will encounter selfishness after I'm gone. So be patient until you meet me at the cistern. After me, you will, you will, innakum satalqawna ba'di athara. That you, in, you Ansar, will see after me, you will undergo after me. Selfishness, abuse. Abuse of your rights. Fasbiru. So be patient. And so in the face 
So in the face of abuse, in the face of selfishness from the rulers, just be patient. Okay. In this hadith, there is the, the command, commandment of patience, forbearance. But let's um, go to the next chapter. Babu man'i. Babu ta'ati al-umara wa in man'a wal Obeying rulers, even if they withhold people's rights. So what does that mean? The very same thing that Ahmad ibn Hanbal earlier said. So what Ahmad said was, of course, uh, consistent with all these ahadith that they have attributed to, to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If a person becomes your, your ruler and he is not a virtuous person, he is not a dignified person, he is he's a very abusive person, he's bloodthirsty, maniac, does not matter. You have to support him and you have to obey him. Okay, look at these ahadith. First hadith. And there are many, many ahadith like this in their books. It was narrated from Alqama ibn Wa'il al-Hadrami that his father said, Sal Salama ibn Yazid al-Ju'afi asked the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, O Messenger of Allah. Let me zoom in. Right, good. Okay. That's too much. Uh, uh, o Messenger of Allah, what do you think if there are appointed over us rulers who, are, who demand their rights and withhold our rights? What do you command us to do? So there, if there are rulers over us, they demand their rights. They demand their taxes. They demand their, their uh, obedience from us. They, if they can enlist us in the army, they could, they could force us to go uh, fight uh, battles under their command. They could take, take taxes from us. And, but they do not give us anything in return. So what we are talking about? We are talking about abusive leaders. What should we do? He turned away from him. And then he asked him again, and he turned away from him. And when he asked him the second or third time, Al-Ash'ath ibn Qais pulled him aside and said, listen, and he pulled him aside and he said, so pulled whom aside? He pulled the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, pulled him. <laughs> so Sahaba were not very, Sahaba were not very, um, Respectful to the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, obviously, right? He said, listen and obey, for on them will be their burden and on you will be your burden. So it doesn't matter if the caliph is very abusive he, and he violates your rights. It does not matter. You have to obey him. So he will answer for his deeds in the day of judgment and you answer for your own deeds. You have to obey him. So there's a commandment of obedience. Commandment of obedience with respect to abusive and um, unjust rulers. The second hadith is another version of the previous one. It says, lesson as uh, to, uh, the answer to the same question, listen and obey for on them be their burdens and on you will be your burden. Okay, you will answer for your deeds and they will answer for you for their deeds. Okay. Now let's go to the next chapter. Babu Jubu Mulazamati Jama'at al Muslimin. In the Dhuhur al Fitan wa fi kulli hal wa tahreem al Khurujim and the Ta'ati wa Mufarakat al Jama'a. The obligation of staying with Jama'a, main body of Muslims. What does that mean? Obligation of staying with the main body of Muslims. <laughs> that means you may never oppose the Caliph. That's what it basically it means. You may never oppose the Caliph. You may never rebel against the Caliph. You ne may never support any person who is thinking of rebelling, of taking up the sword against the Caliph. Okay. The obligation of staying with Jama'ah, main body of Muslims, when fitan, tribulations, appear. Fitan appears and there are rebellions. There are rebellions against the ruler. And, and in, all, in, in all circumstances, in all circumstances, you have to obey the caliph. The prohibition of re refusing to obey and on splitting away from the Jama'ah. Okay. So, 
by jama'i. But what is this jama'i? The jama'i is that jama'i which is obeying the caliph, obviously. Not the jama'i who are on haq, who are following the right path, even if they are a French group. No. Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman said, the people used to ask the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about good things, but I used to ask him about bad things, fearing that I would live to see such things. Okay. I said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, we are in a state of ignorance. We were in a state of ignorance and evil. And Allah sent us this good, this good, yani Islam. Will there be any evil after this good? He said, yes. I said, yes. I said, will there be any good after that evil? He said, yes, but it will be tainted. I said, how will it be tainted? He said, there will be. So after this good time, this blessed time of, of companionship with the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So before the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they were in Jahiliyyah. And then the blessed times came, times of guidance to be under the leadership of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the bliss of his leadership. So is there going to be an evil time after this? Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, yes. And there will be will there be um, any good after that evil time? He said, yes, but it will be tainted. How tainted it will be? How evil it will be? He said, there will be some people who follow an example other than my example and follow a way other than my way. He will approve of some of their deeds and disapprove of the, of others. I said, will there be any evil after that good? He said, yes. There will be people calling at the gates of hell who, and whoever respond to their call, they will throw them into it. I said, oh, messenger of Allah, describe them to us. They will be from among our people speaking our language. I said, oh, messenger of Allah, what do you command me? to do if I live to see such a thing. He said, adhere to the jama'ah, group community main body of the Muslims and their imam leader. I asked, what if there is no jama'ah and no leader? He said, then keep away from all those groups, even if you were to have to bite on the roots of a tree under, until death overtakes you while you are on that state. Okay. Perhaps you say this is not very clear to you. Let me show you another. The next hadith. Clarifies the previous hadith and uh, removes any ambiguity there might there might be. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, After I am gone, there will be a'imma leaders who will not follow my way and will not follow my example. Among them, there will be men whose hearts are the hearts of devils, Satan, and the bodies of men. So they will be personification of, de of the devil. They will be embodiment of Satan. If Satan were to appear in the form of a human being, it will be the leaders after the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I said, what should I do, O Messenger of Allah, if I live to see that? He said, hear and obey the ruler. <laughs> so <laughs> how convenient, right? Does not matter how bad the ruler is, even if the ruler is not on the path of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? There will be leaders who will not follow my way and will not follow my example. Among them, there will be men whose hearts are the hearts of devils and the bodies of men. Kulub is the ruh, the spirit, the personality, the, the identity, the Satan, will be will be exemplified in their bodies so there will be such people they're not following nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam neither his ways nor his guidance his teachings and they will be 
their bodies would be, their forms would be forms of human beings, but they will be very evil people, as evil as Satan himself. So what should I do at this time? Hudayfa asked, the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, he said, hear and obey the ruler, the ruler, even if your back is flogged and your wealth is taken, hear and obey. Okay. So that is the case. It doesn't matter. So, so now you understand the theory of Imama and the Omar school of thought. The Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam neither has appointed anyone after him, nor he has given you a formula who should be the Imam after him. What how should the Ummah do? What is the directives? What are the processes through which a person, if he undergoes and he follows them, he becomes Imam? None has been established by Allah or Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's number one. Number two, there are three ways a person becomes Imam. And these three ways are neither from Quran or Sunnah. They're just arbitrarily made by ulama. One is through succession, one is through Ahlul Halli wal Aqd, even if one person, one sheikh, one chief of a tribe or a one militia leader pledges allegiance to a person, he becomes Imam if he can kiss the throne. Number three <coughs> is through uh, uh, sheer power, violence, if a person becomes king or caliph by killing all his opponents. And now, if such people, will be, once you become a caliph, it does not matter how bad your character is, how even if Satan appears in the form of a human being and he is flogging your back and he's taking wealth, you have to obey. <laughs> okay. <coughs> okay. And now this obviously this had throughout history. It had... Um, Ramifications, this ideology. Very dire, very bitter, and very tragic ramifications in the Muslim society. One of these ramifications what happened, what happened in the incident and the tragedy, tragedy in the macabre and uh, horrible and bloody massacre of Al Harra. Uh, So as you know, in the, uh, around year 63, 64, people of Medina, under the leadership of Abdullah ibn Zubayr, they rebelled against Yazid ibn Abi Sufyan. And they chased away the governor that was appointed on Medina by Yazid's uh, court. And they pledged allegiance to Abdullah ibn Zubayr. Abdullah ibn Zubayr himself moved to Mecca and made Mecca his capital. And he had his generals uh, taking care of Medina and administering Medina on his behalf. So the news reached 
uh, Yazid in, Mac in, in, in Damascus that people of Medina have rebelled against him. So what did Yazid do? Yazid appointed a Sahabi by the name of Muslim ibn Uqba. Muslim ibn Uqba. As a military leader to go and um, attack Medina al Munawwara. And he told them that give them a warning for three days, and after three days, if they do not surrender, go ahead and attack Medina. And then you have open hands for three days that you uh, commit massacre and take women and rape them and loot Medina al Munawwara as you will for three days. And that's exactly what he did. And it's been mentioned in many, many books. The event of Al Harra. This is the book of Al Bidaya wa Nihaya ibn Kathir al Dimashqi, volume number eight, published by Dari ibn Kathir, Waqat al Harra, at the year 63 Hijri. 63 Hijri. This Harra happened. Okay, why, why did Harra happen? He said that Abdullah ibn Zubair, people of Medina, they pledged allegiance to Abdullah ibn Zubair, and Abdullah ibn Zubair became a caliph. But he made Mecca his capital. And then, who was, who was ruling Medina at the time? It was Abdullah ibn Muti from Ansar, and Abdullah ibn Handala from, Afwan, Abdullah ibn Muti from Quraysh, and Abdullah, um, wa, Abdullah ibn Handala from Ansar. So he had two people, Abdullah ibn Zubair, as rulers of uh, Medina, one for Ansar and one for, for, um, for um, people of Medina, uh, one for uh, uh, Muhajirin. And then they had a meeting in the mosque of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and people spoke against Yazid. And they said, they gathered uh, under the pulpit of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and they would, every man, Every man in the audience, he would pick up his turban or he would take off his shoes. And he said, just as I'm taking off my turban from my head, I'm dismissing Yazid as the caliph and throwing it on the ground. Okay. And then some of them would take off their shoes and hit it on the ground and say, um, just as I'm taking off my shoes from my feet, <laughs> I'm discharging Yazid, Yazid from, the, from the throne and Yazid is no longer my king. So there was a big pile of turbans and shoes in the mosque. And that, so people of Medina rebelled. So what did he do, Yazid? Yazid ba'atha ila Muslim ibn Uqba al-Murri. Muslim ibn Uqba al-Murri huwa shaykhun kabirun da'if. He was a weak old man, but he's a Sahabi. Obviously, he volunteered for this task. So Yazid gave him 10,000 or 12,000 cavalry and 15,000 infantry. So if even we say 10 plus 15 is 25, 25 or 27,000 troops. Very big number of troops for the time. And he gave each person in the army in that, in that uh armed garrison, gave them 100 dinars. And some have said, uh, uh, four dinars. Okay, and he sent them to Medina. Yazid said to Muslim, Ibn Uqba, Ud'u al-qawma thalathan, fa'in raja'u ila ta'ati faqbal minhum, wa kuffa anhum, wa illa fasta'in billah wa qatilhum. He said, go to Medina. Tell them to surrender. Surrender, on what terms? Surrender that you are slaves of Yazid. If Yazid, if he wants to sell you, he will sell you. In slavery, so submit to the rule of Yazid, whatever Yazid wants to do with you. And if they do not agree and they do not surrender, and this term will come, inshallah, wa ta'ala, you attack them. And when you are victorious over them, Medina for three days. For three days, your army must loot Medina and your army must rape the women of Medina and your army must kill the people of Medina. And after three days then, 
Okay, then stop. وقد كان يزيد كتب إلى عبيد الله بن زياد أن يسير إلى ابن الزبير فيحاصره بما كافع أبا عليه وقال والله لا أجمعهما للفاسق أبدا أقتل ابن بنت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وأغزو البيت الحرام وقد كانت أمه مرجانة قاتلت قالت له حين قتل الحسين عليه السلام ويحك ما صنعت وما ضارك عنفته عن نفت تعنيفا شديدا uh, يزيد initially wanted to appoint عبيد الله بن زياد the governor of Kufa he wanted to appoint him as the army leader to go and attack Mecca. But um, because Ubaid, Abdullah ibn Zubair was in Mecca. But Ubaidillah ibn Ziyad said, no, I will not do this. I've killed Imam Hussein alayhi salam. That's enough for me. And I'm not going to go attack uh, Mecca now on you because of you degenerate. And because his mother, Marjana, was mad at him. This is what they have narrated. Then on the following page, says Ibn Kathir. Ibn Kathir is the student, as you know, a student of Ibn Taymiyyah. And Ibn Taymiyyah also in his many books, he affirms the incident of Harrah. He does not deny. He says, ثُمَّ أَبَاحَ مُسْلِمْ بْنُ عُقْبَةِ الَّذِي يَقُولُ فِيهِ السَّلَفْ مُسْرِفْ بْنُ عُقْبَةِ قَبَّحَ اللَّهُ مِنْ شَيْخِ سُوءٍ مَا أَجْهَلَهِ الْمَدِينَةَ ثَلَاثَةَ أَيَّامٍ كَمَا أَمَرَهُ يَزِيد لا جزاه الله خيرا. And then when Muslim came to Medina, Muslim ibn Uqba, uh, he did indeed, as Yazid had commanded him, he made Medina um, uh, Medina subject to looting and raping and massacre for his army for three days, as Yazid had commanded him. وَقَتَلَ خَلْقًا مِنْ أَشْرَافِهَا وَقُرَّائِهَا وَانْتَهَبَتْ أَمْوَالًا كَثِيرَةً مِنْهَا And he killed a great number of people from the virtuous people of Medina and uh, knowledgeable people, people of Medina, and he looted a lot of money. And then, on the following page, he says, They raped women in Medina. They raped the daughters of Sahaba and granddaughters of Sahaba, Muhajirin and Ansar, who raped Yazid's army for three days. So much so that they are saying that 1,000 women became pregnant in Ghayr Zawjan, who were not married. 1,000 unmarried girls, they became pregnant. Now, how many married women they became pregnant? That's another story. <laughs> And then he narrates, وَلَدَتْ أَلْفُ إِمْرَأَةٍ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْمَدِينَةِ بَقْعَ بَعْدَ وَقَتِ الْحَرَّ مِنْ غَيْرِ زَوْدِ One thousand women gave birth, were not married, after the massacre of Harra, because of rape. rape. Then he, um, He narrates that someone asked Zuhri, كم كانت قتلى يوم الحرة؟ قال سبعة مئة من وجوه الناس والمهاجين والأنصار ووجوه الموالي ومن من لا أعرف من حر وعبد وغيرهم عشت آلاف Someone asked Zuhri, Muslim ibn Shahab al-Zuhri, how many people were killed in Medina because Zuhri was alive at the time. He said that from the senior people of Medina, people who are of name and fame and repute, 700 people were killed. And from the servants and slaves, 10,000 people were killed. Yeah. And they looted Medina for three days. And, the, uh, and then Mus the, the um, leader of this, obviously this mission was Muslim ibn Uqba. He's a Sahabi. Al-Isaba fi Tamiz al-Sahaba, al-Juz al-Ashir. Published in Cairo in year 2008, page 444, Sahabi number, companion number 
451 Muslim in Uqba to Adraq al Nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he had an idraq of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay. Ibn Taymiyyah also uh, amongst the Nawazib because they want to defend Yazid. So their, their uh, foremost respected scholar is Ibn Taymiyyah. Ibn Taymiyyah mentioned that a rape has happened in the, in the event of Harra. Majmu'at al-Fatawa, Shaykh al-Ilhad Ibn Taymiyyah, uh, he died in year 728 Hijri, uh, volume number three. Look, uh, this is page number 254. Okay. People of Medina, they discharged the bay'ah of Yazid. They exiled, they kicked out the deputies and governors and tribesmen of Yazid. Yazid sent an army to quell them. And Yazid commanded his army, if people of Medina do not surrender, enter Medina by force and for three days loot Medina and rape Medina. So for three days his, his army in Medina, they were killing people and they were committing Massacres and the Yaftadun al Furuj al Muharrama, and they were deflowering virgin Yaftadun al Furuj al Muharrama, and they were, how would you say this word, al Furuj al Muharrama? They were, uh, they were uh, raping honorable women. You see, that's what he's saying for three days, and they were running their horses in the masjid of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay, so what was, uh, now what, when this was happening, let me show you one more. Um, and then he took bay'ah from Medi people of Medina, that they are his slaves. <laughs> let me show you that. Okay. And now, when all of this was happening, all of this was happening, what was the... Oh, Yajid this, did this and... At the same time, it, the hadith in Sahih Muslim, Abdullah ibn Umar was arguing on, um, in support of Yazid that be, because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said that even if, you're, if your leader is corrupt, you have to follow him and you have to support him. And the hadith in, his Muslim, in al Muslim, where, in which uh, Here is the Muslim. Perhaps I could show you this in English also. Let me get you the English version.
Well, it will be difficult. It will take me some time to find you the English version. Uh, I'll show you the Arabic version. Uh, this is Muslim by Muslim al Hajjaj al Kushayri and Naishaburi. Published by Darul Fikr at year 2010. Okay, here. Kitabul Imara. Uh, Kitabul Imara. Page number 942, hadith number 4686. So, Ja Abdullah ibn Umar, Hina Kana min Amr al Harrati ma Khan. Ja Abdullah ibn Muti. At the time of Harra, when it was the, the tragedy happened, Abdullah ibn Umar came to Abdullah ibn Mutiyah and he said to him, من خلع يدا من طاعة لقي الله يوم القيامة لا حجة له ومن مات وليس في عنقه بيع ما تميت جاهليا. So when Yazid was doing all of this, right, raping women of Medina and looting, but because because it's their principle that you have to support and you have to obey a an imam even if he's vile, even if he's abusive, he, even if he's a maniac. You have to support him and obey him. That's why Abdullah ibn Umar at that time came to the people of Medina and he was preaching, preaching for Yazid that if you Muslims die and you do not have bay'ah of Yazid and you have not pledged bay'ah to Yazid, you will die as a pagan. You will go straight to hell. So throughout Islamic history, all over, every century, every era, this has been very convenient for dictators for despots, for tyrants, to rule the Muslims and commit any kind of bloodshed and abuse and transgression and have full immunity from, uh, from, the, uh, from a religious point of view and enjoy the support and obedience of the people because religiously it's incumbent upon Muslims to support such rulers. Okay, thank you so much. May Allah bless you all. Now I'm going to See if I have any callers today. All right. All right, we have here a caller from Australia. Assalamu alaikum, go ahead, please. Wa alaikum assalam. Who's calling me, brother? Hi, Sheikh Alayari, how are you? Good, thank you. What's your name? My name is Azhar. I'm calling from Melbourne, Australia. Thank you for calling, Akbar. What's happening? Uh, I'm good, uh, good uh, not much, man. Just uh, <laughs> casual stuff here in Melbourne, same as usual. Um, I'll do five questions to ask, please. Be a short question. All right. My first two questions are, um, can you show me Imam Ali in the Quran and, uh, and other, uh, other Imams in, in the, from the Quran? And um, can you recommend any history books? So the, 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 the Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wa salam are in many verses of the Noble Quran, amongst them, in Bali, in the Mawali, Kumullah, or a Sulu, who will let in a am and let in a Yukimuna Salata, or Yotuna Zakata, or Hum Rock your own. Let me look it up. Which, uh, which surah is this? For Hum Rock your own. Verily, your, your, your guardian and your ruler is Allah and his Rasul, Sallallahu Alaihi Wali was Salam, and that Mu'min who is who prays, and while he is bowing, while he is doing a ruku. He is pay, he's paying his zakah. And there is no disagreement amongst Muslims that this verse was uh, sent down by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu was salam when he was, on the, when he was bowing down in his prayers when he was doing ruku in his salah he gave his, his uh, ring to a person who had asked for alms who had asked for donations. This is verse number 55 in Surah Al-Ma'idah. 
And with and there are many other verses as well. And with regard to Ahlul Bayt alayhim as-salatu was salam, the holy Imams alayhim as-salam, Ya ayuhal ladhina amanu taqullah wa kunu ma'as sadiqeen. Oh, believers, fear God and follow the sadiqeen. If a person lies once in his life, he is not a true sadiq. If a person makes errors in his speech, and he mis makes a mistake, he's not being truthful while he is he is making an error, error in his speech. So to be a true, a true sadiq, a truthful person, one has to be ma'asum infallible. And there's no question in ummah that nobody has even claimed isma after the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam except the 12 imams and the verse of tathir as well, okay? These are the verses from the Thank Noble you Quran. You have any, okay, you have any other question? Yes, I do. Uh, as I said, I had five questions, so you answered one. The second question was about history. Can you recommend any history books? Okay, books of history. Uh, uh, the one I would recommend is a uh, book um, of, uh, there are many good books. Bihar al-Anwar has, has a very good book of history. As sahih min as sirah is not a bad book. The book of uh, Al-Ghadir, the big portion of Al-Ghadir, deals with history. So these would be uh, my recommendation of books of history. Jalaul Uyun is in Persian. I don't know if it's been translated into English or not. By Allama Al-Majlisi. That's also a very good book. Okay? Thank you, very, thank you very much. My other three questions are, when did, uh, when did, uh, when and how did Ishtihad and Taqlid start in Shia Madhab? And uh, so it was, the fourth question is, yeah. how is jihad has changed over the the last eight or nine centuries? Mm -hmm. So, uh, jihad and Shia Madhab started way, way after the Ghaibah of the Imam alayhi salam, the major occultation. So, around uh, 460 Hijri, Sheikh uh, Sheikh uh, Tusi he wrote his book Al Mabsut. That was the first book, the major book. Before him, Ibn Junaid had written a book in Ijtihad, but that he was he didn't have much followership. But the change came after Sheikh Tusi uh, wrote Al Mabsut, and that was the first major book in, in Fiqh. So before that, Shias did not even have any book on Fiqh. So our Fiqh was our Hadith. And when he wrote that, he didn't write that book in order for Shias to follow his fatwas as ijtihad. He says he is writing that book because the uh, Omaris, they are saying that Shias do not have fiqh and they are denigrating and they are taunting the Shia for not having any jurisprudence. So that's why he's writing this book. And that was, that's not a very good excuse. So for even if after he wrote that book, Ijtihad did not become popular amongst Shias, so it took a much longer time, centuries passed, and then uh, gradually Ijtihad became, and Taqlid became more um, widespread, and following Hadith was gradually pushed aside and abandoned. It took a long time. Taqlid as we, we have today, that we have Marja'iyya, and people shift from taqlid of one person to another person when the marja dies. This is a very new phenomenon that people give them their homes, their arms to a marja. This is very new. This is perhaps not more than 150 or 200 years old. But uh, ijtihad, before, before the current form of ijtihad and taqlid, people generally in Shia, in Shia, in Shia countries, they used to follow al-muhaqqiq al-hilli. Long after his demise, after his death, his book Sharia al-Islam, that was the main book that the scholars used to learn. And they used to give uh, teach people according to the fatwas of al-Muhaqqiq al hilli Okay? What's your other book? You what what, what, what was the other question? Uh, so, uh, my, my last question was, uh, so you, you answered that taqlid, taqlid mm -hmm. uh, like what we have today in we didn't have like 200 years ago this this type of taqlid that we have today. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it has changed over time. Like before, it used mm -hmm. to be uh, muhakkat that you muhakkat muhakkat al that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And yeah. he had did he have like the same same sort of concept of ishtihad and taqlid that he would just give fatwa and everyone has to follow and his um puja on everyone and they have so, to follow him. 
So what I gather, because there are not too many books really written uh, at the time, how she has acted, how the Shia practiced their religion uh, for centuries. These a lot of there's there are big holes in dark, uh, like dark areas in in history that we do not have information in that regard. So there are a little bit tiny bits here and there. Uh, well, for instance, a Shahid Thani, who is a very prominent jurist himself, he mentioned in his uh, he has an book on Ijtihad, therein he mentions that at his time, scholars do not study hadith at all, and they do not study fiqh also. They merely study mm -hmm. uh, the book of uh, Sharai al-Islam of al-Muhaqqiq al-Hilli, and they answer people's question according to, to the book of uh, Sharai al-Islam. And that was the case for, for a long time. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, brother. May Allah bless you. Last question, please. My last yeah. question, please. You um, you respect Sheikh Murtaza Ansari a lot. And my question is, was he a mushtaid or was he like, uh, did he, was he a mushtaid himself or taqlidi? Oh, I do not respect him for his views or anything. I respect him because he was a very pious, because his, his scholars, his scholars, despite their mistakes and their errors on the question of ijtihad and taqlid, I do not believe a lot of these people committed these errors intentionally. So mm -hmm. if they intentionally, yes, Sheikh Murtada Al-Ansari was of course a mujtahid and he believed in taqlid and he promoted taqlid. Nonetheless, so and and of course, this is, an, uh, this is a great uh, and grave error. And, but I don't think he erred and he, um, uh, he, he abandoned the right path intentionally. They, they were led because in the environment there were, in the books they were reading, and the teachers they had, and the line they were following, they, they, um, that was what was provided to them. And it's not demonstrably proven to me that Sheikh Murtada Al Ansari or people like him, they, in, they indeed realized that ijtihad and taqlid are erroneous and false. And they did not come to the right path. Maybe some of them did, but it's not clear to me that. Uh, so, so, but at the meantime, Sheikh Murtada Ansari was for his piety mostly, not anything else, not grad, great um, scholarship in Hadith or Quran. No, nothing like that. He, he's, uh, his uh, knowledge of Quran and Hadith is very, very limited, as a matter of fact. So I say, when I he mention him, I, I do, yeah, he was a pious man. And he was a Shia scholar, he died. I don't have any particular reverence for him that I greatly respect him, no. But when I mention him, I seek forgiveness for him. I seek mercy of Allah for him because he has died and he was Shia. And perhaps tomorrow other people will come and they will find my faults and my mistakes that I have committed them unintentionally. And I hope they will also yeah. seek forgiveness from Allah for me. So I, I do not I do not badmouth these ulama despite I see them as being on error because it's not clear to me that they intentionally, deliberately, for the purpose of seeking dunya, they followed path of ishtihad and taqlid and, did not, and, and they did not care about religion. So, but today's scholars are different. And today's, and today the Shia scholars, lots of them, as you know, are terrorists. They kill people, they rape yeah. people, they give fatwa of killing and raping. And we, we know that for a fact in Iran. The scholars, yeah. scholars engage in that kind of behavior and uh, torturing people in prisons. Who gives these fatwas? People who are tortured in Iran in prisons, they are tortured by fatwa of scholars. So, so yeah. that's very, and scholars today, um, even if it's proved to them that this matters against Quran and Sunnah, they do not care. And I know that for a fact. So if I do not respect yeah, contemporary, yeah. some of the contemporary scholars, that is for for a different reason. Okay, thank you so much. May Allah bless you. Okay, take thank care. Thank you. You've explained everything. Uh, all right. All right thank brother. you so much. Thank, thank you. you thank so you. Much. Okay. May Allah bless you. All right. Let me pick up this call. Salamu alaikum, brother. Go ahead, please. What's up, caller? Sen Salamu alaikum. Alaikum salam, sister. Where are you calling from? Um, from United States, Chicago. Yes, sister. Yes, sister. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Um, my question is regarding, um, as you know, there are some sayings attributed to Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam that, yeah. that are kind of degrading and some say misogynistic towards women. And 
I asked some sheikhs. Some say that he meant Aisha because she fought him in Jamal. Uh, mm-hmm. And others say, no, um, he's describing the attributes of all women. So for us um, as a Shia woman in this time and age, how can we make sense of these um, so, riwayats? So, so uh, um, one thing is for a fact. Uh, as a principle of Quran, as a principle of Sunnah of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salatu wasalam, any person who believes uh, and any person who commits good deeds, he goes to paradise. He enjoys the highest status in paradise. Whether he's a man or woman, it does not make any difference. So in that regard, there's no difference. Man or woman, in the eyes of Allah, it depends, it depends on your iman and your good deeds and your love for Ahlul Bayt alayhi salatu wasalam you will go to paradise. That's number one. Number two, despite this, there's a, obviously there's a difference between man and woman. They're not the same. They're not the same. So uh, men are more intelligent, like generally more intelligent than women. That's, that's a biological fact. And their IQ level and their brain size and modern science confirms that. And that is not to put women down. Women, women have other qualities. Men are stronger in their physique. It doesn't mean that, okay, then, and then women are bad. It just, it's just that's how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us. And um, women undergo their monthly period. Men do not go under, undergo their monthly period. But, so these are just some, some superficial differences between men and women. And some hadith mention these, these, these differences. We have to, these are true. Nobody with a, with a common sense, with, with a good conscience can deny these differences. But this doesn't mean women are bad. Women are, uh, women, women are in the eyes of Allah, in the day of judgment, and their value before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they have a lower status. This just means we are different. Some people are created more beautiful. Some people are created less beautiful. Some people are created stronger, taller. Some people are created weaker and shorter, even amongst men. And then the same way amongst women, some women are more more desirable, they are more. They have more beauty. Some women have mediocre beauty. So this is all in creation. All are not created equal. But in the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will create, will, will reward everybody according to many things. Amongst them, Iman and Amal Saleh. And then also, if he was deprived of something in this world, if a person was afflicted with pain, he was afflicted with uh, with. Uh, with misfortunes and misgivings in this dunya that were not his doing. And this is called al-a'wadh, the um, exchanges, the question of exchange. If a person in this dunya sees, sees tragedies, although that's not a good deed, if, if a calamity befalls a person, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, in the day of judgment, will reward him for that and will compensate for that. So, so this dunya, this, this um, life, it's going to pass, but what is eternal is the hereafter. Okay, sister, any other question? Okay, so when he says, uh, for example, وَكُنُوا عَلَىٰ خِيَارُهِنَّ عَلَىٰ حَذَرٍ وَكُنُوا مِنْ خِيَارُهِنَّ عَلَىٰ حَذَرٍ Does that mean even good women are so, a source of evil? I don't know. I have to look it up, and I, it's not in my mind right now. So if you give me time, I'll look it up, and we, I'll see you in what you... You're, is this in Nahjul Balagha, or is this in another book? Yes, Nahjul Balagha. So uh, Nahjul Balagha, Nahjul Balagha, there are many things in Nahjul Balagha that are narrated on the authority or through the chains of non-Shia, non-Shia chains of authority. So everything in Nahjul Balagha is not, is not Shia hadith. Shari, Al-Sharif al Radi in his books, and he has a book, Al-Majazat al nabawiyah He narrates most of his hadith from Mukhalifin, from non-Shia. So if this hadith is um, Unwa, uh, let me look it up. Kunu min khiyarahinna? Min khiyarahinna? Min khiyarahinna. Kunu min khiyarahinna ala hadar. Wala tuti'ahunna fi ma'atil ma'aruf. Oh, this is, this is, um, Dhakar al-Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam nisa faqalu awsuhunna fi ma'aruf qabla an ya'murna kum bil'u. So this, 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 there's nothing wrong with this hadith. Uh, the, uh, let me bring the, my book, uh, uh, it's an al-kafi, and I'll bring it to you, and I'll translate it. Okay, one moment. There might be hadith similar, but this is from Khutbah in Nahj al Okay, I'll show you. I'll show you the same from Al Kafi. That's all right. 
Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay. So um, a person should not obey his wife. A person should not obey his wife. Obedience is different than than uh, than uh, you respect or value a woman, obviously. So a man should not obey his wife. And you know, uh, lots of family problems, lots of these things happen because a woman blind, blindly follows his wife's advice or his wife's uh, commands and requests. And uh, we have seen this in our lifetimes. So this is al furu I mean, Al-Kafi from uh, Dal Kutub al-Islamiyah. Uh, page 516 بابن. بابن that you should not give blind obedience to your wife okay and I, I, I and that aside from this is the command of Rasulullah this is a fact this is a point of wisdom for all men to listen to okay what's that hadith that's here uh Okay, this this the hadith. Hadith is here. ذكر الرسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم فقال عصوهن في المعروف قبل أن يأمرنكم بالمنكر. So, do, do not raise the expectation of, of your wives. Do not do a something good because just because your wife asks you to do, because one day they will ask you to do something wrong. So do not raise the expectations. And your woman, uh, not just your wives, but just women in general, from evil women, seek refuge unto Allah. And women who are good, just be careful with them. That's what it means. Women who are good, who are virtuous, be careful with them. It doesn't mean to treat them bad or just be, be be careful with them, because uh, good people also, because they're not masum, they're not infallible. They could also make a mistake, and they could, or it, it could mean a good woman could, could, if she is not your wife, she could draw you to a sin. You could you could do lots of errors. Just be careful. That there's nothing wrong with that counsel. I think that's a very good counsel. Okay, thank you, sister. May Allah bless you. Okay. Okay, thank you. May Allah bless you. You too. Thank you. Okay. This hadith also in the same page is narrated from Amir al Mu'minin alayhi salatu was salam. Okay, one moment, uh, WhatsApp caller. I'll take you in a moment. Uh, اتقوا شرار النساء وكونوا من خيارهن قال أمير المؤمنين عليه السلام اتقوا شرار النساء the same page اتقوا شرار النساء وكونوا من خيارهن على هذر uh, avoid bad women avoid evil women and good women be careful with them now being careful with a woman it doesn't mean you treat them disrespectfully or you put them down you just be careful be careful if a good, if a if a person is a good woman, don't you know? Don't uh, follow her blindly, and whatever she tells you, wherever she asks you to go, whatever she asks you to buy, just because she's a good woman, don't do that. No, be be careful. Just be careful, even with good women. Yeah, and this does not mean it necessarily means she's your wife. She could be a neighbor's wife. She's a good woman. Be careful with her. If she the neighbor's wife is a bad woman, so totally avoid. Do not talk to her. Do not go near her because you'll get into trouble. You all know that, right? Okay, we have a caller from the U.S. Go ahead, brother. Yeah. What's up, caller? What's your name? Uh, hello. Uh, yeah, this is uh, Tasir Ali. Hey, Tasir Ali Zadi. Uh, yes, brother, Kibla, how are you? Good. May Allah bless you. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. good. So, um, first of all, uh, I want to thank you uh, for your members only lecture. That featured like I think two weeks ago. Um, no, I, I never heard the hadith or the tradition in, in, in a way that you explained. 
Okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, my first question is, I think you have touched on this topic in one of your Urdu's lecture of Uli Lamr, the ayah of Uli Lamr. Mm-hmm. So I, I just, but you, you just touched on that topic, you didn't explain, but I, I want to know how does it actually substantiate uh, or point toward the imamate of Imam Ali? Because when I, when I talk with my Sunni fellows uh, and um, friends, uh, they say that it's 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 a general statement. It's for everyone. Like you were mentioning today, that uh, uh, no, Muslim but no, I, I, I'll explain it to you. Okay, wa atiu Allah wa atiu Rasul wa uli al amr min kum. Obi Allah, obi Rasul, and your uli al amr, the person who is on the position of rulership. This position of rulership, giving him same ta'a, uh, same ta'a as Allah and Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This is not a conditional obedience. This is absolute obedience. Ati'ullah wa ati'ur rasul wa ulil amri minkum. This unconditional, same sort of uh, uh, ta'a that you give to Allah and Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, you cannot give. You cannot give a uh, to anyone but who, uh, who is not ma'asum. We give al- ta'a to Allah because Allah, of course, if we d- d- disobey him, we will be, we will be condemned to hell. And Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, in every condition, in every state, we have to obey him and follow him because he's infallible. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, follow him. And wa'ati'ullah, look, this is the verse. Uh, this is the verse. Ya ayuhu al-ladhina amanu, ati'ullah wa'ati'ur rasul. Okay. Do uh, obey Allah and obey Rasul and Uli Al-Amr. Obey Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and Uli Al-Amr. So the same obedience that is proven for Allah uh, for Allah and Rasul, the same Uli Al-Amr is proven for Uli Al-Amr. Unconditional, unrestricted. So you obey Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam no matter what his command is. No matter what his request is, his demand is, right? Without any stipulation, day or night, pertains to military issues, economic issues, even if it seems wrong to you. If Allah asks you something to do, you have to do it. If Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asks you to do it, if, even if you do not understand its wisdom, you have to follow it. A person, a person uh, gives talaq to his wife three times, right? Then another person has to marry her and penetrate her sexual intercourse with her, then if he divorces, then you can marry her. Now, now it, a lot of people may dislike this, but they cannot touch that woman. If you have given her three talaq, you cannot touch her until this happens. So this obedience to Allah and Rasul is unconditional. Likewise, the um, same, same sort of obedience is required for ulil amr. Now, if this ulil amr is non-ma'asum, is not infallible, then he's, he is Absolute obedience to non ma'asum is is very manifestly wrong because non ma'asum could ask you to kill your somebody innocent. He could ask you thousands of things that are illegitimate. He is he he does not deserve the same sort of obedience as Allah and Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Therefore, this ulil amr has to be ma'asum, and there is nobody ma'asum in the ummah. None of the khulafa, none of the imams of Umariya, they've claimed isma except Ahl al Bayt alayhim wasallam. Look, this is Tafsir of Fakhr Razi, volume number 10, published by Darul Fikr. Ya ayhud ladhina amanu ati Allah wa ati Rasul wa ulil amr minkum. And then on page 148, uh, under the same uh, verse, he talks about Inna Allah ta'ala amara bi ta'ati ulil amr ala sabil al jazm fi hadhi al ayah. Wa man amara Allah bi ta'ati ala sabil al jazm wa laqat illa budda wa an yakuna ma'asuman an al khata'a. Allah Ta'ala has commanded us to follow Ulil Amr and obey Ulil Amr unconditionally and without any sort of reservation. And such command of obeying a person unconditionally, this presupposes that he must be ma'asum from errors. He must be infallible against errors. And now he says, okay, our rulers are not infallible. Therefore, he says, Ulil Amr is not our rulers. Who is Ulil Amr? He says, the Ummah, the Ijma of Ummah. If 
Fakhr Razi says that. But we know, but we know that Ulil Amr does not mean Ijma of Ummah. Ulil Amr is a person or individuals. Not, is, Ijma is not called Ulil Amr. So Fakhr Razi, because he has this bias against Shias, he does not want to concede that Ulil Amr or Ahlul Bayt, alayhim salam, he says it's Ijma. It's not our caliphs, it's not our kings. Ulil Amr, Ulil Amr is our Ijma. So that is the answer because the verse, verse commands us to follow unconditionally and give unconditional obedience. That presupposes Isma. Okay? Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, are you able to hear me? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and um, uh, just uh, very quick questions. Uh, which books, uh, because I like to read um, or study about the letters of Imam Hussain that he wrote to the people of Kufa while he was mm. um, in contact with him and they were they were saying that they were in support of him so which book should would you recommend to read or one should study to um oh i don't read know those in letters english or have... okay uh, tabari mentions not, not... those letters tariq tabari mentions lots of those letters tariq tabari has been translated into english uh, on the shia side bihar al-anwar volume 44 onwards and then um Lots of books of Maqatil. Yeah, uh, yeah, lots of books. There are lots of books on those on this issue. Maqatil. Lots of Maqatil. Yeah, I've mentioned these letters. Okay, thank you so much. May Allah bless you. Okay, let me take another call. Okay, thank you. Thank thank you. you. Salamu alaikum. Go ahead, please. Uh, alaikum salam. Uh, this is Who's the caller? Yeah, Jawad. Where are you calling from? Uh, United States. Oh, okay. What's happening, brother? Michigan? Um, I, I'm sorry? Detroit. Are you calling from Detroit? Oh, uh, yes, I'm on that area. I saw, I saw your number, Detroit number. Okay, go ahead, please. Yeah. Um, my question is, can you tell me the difference between the Ahraf and the Qara'ah? Oh, so Ahraf, uh, from Shia standpoint, Ahraf is wrong. There's no such thing as Ahraf. So, because... Uh, um, Oh, the Omaris, they started this, this story as uh, the, uh, principally Omar that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed Quran on, on, uh, with different versions. There are different versions of Quran. There are seven versions of Quran. And what are mm -hmm. these versions of Quran? It's never explained except we, we can deduce from various hadith that they are each verse of the Noble Quran, each surah of Quran, they with different ver wordings. With different, with different, uh, with different uh, uh, phraseology and phrases and choice of words, they they were different from, from one another. They were revealed. So this is huruf al sabah, the seven uh, letters or seven versions of the Noble Quran. Ahl al Bayt alayhim as salatu wasam have clearly enunciated that the Quran was revealed only one version, not seven versions. Now, why did Omar? start this story because a lot of people did not know Quran and and especially after the demise of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam lots of people converted to Islam because there were rapid conquests and lots of Muslims lots of territories were captured and many many people became Muslims and when they came to Medina yeah. there, there was no Quran people didn't have Quran at that time because Quran was compiled by Ahl al-Bayt right after the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Sahaba didn't want that Quran. And Abu Bakr and Omar that they had compiled the Quran that there was, they were, they had compiled that Quran but not everybody had that Quran. And Sahaba had, then Sahaba like Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Abdullah Ubay ibn Ka'ab, these people, they had also compiled their own uh, Qurans and their Qurans were different. They were different. So, so uh, Omar, Officially, and then after a few uh, centuries, these ahadith are also attributed to people other than Umar as well. The Quran has been uh, revealed and sent down with different versions. So it's my understanding right. that they started this because they, they wanted to explain to people. Because in all these ahadith, in Bukhari and Muslim and other books that mention the seven versions of Quran, there's this addition, this, this phrase attributed to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he said, any version is good. If you read and recite any version, that's good. So 
I am, it's my understanding that because Omar and Abu Bakr, they attempted to compile Quran and they failed. And other Sahaba had been, obviously, there's many hadiths to that effect. And Omar himself said Quran has been lost. And other Sahaba, they had also compiled Quran and their Qurans did not jibe in. They, the Quran, there were differences between these Qurans. And that's why there was, uh, um, they have uh, in Bukhari and, uh, and Tafsir al-Tabari, there are many narrations. They were going to kill each other. Because of the difference in Qur'ans. So in order to placate mm -hmm. people, in order to, to, um, to, to deceive them and to ask them not to worry about not having the proper Qur'an, he said, okay, the Qur'an that we have gathered is one of those seven verses of Qur'an. And then, right. and then the Omari books, there's total silence. On what, what were the differences between this, these seven versions? Except the versions were, the difference were in their words. And so, and then what happened to these seven versions of Quran? There's no talk about that. It, there's no hadith. What happened? Where did it go? Except the fact that in Bukhari and many other books that Uthman gathered all Qurans and he burned them, except he kept one, one Quran and he burned all others. So, and then when he, so we don't have a lot of detail about about the other Qurans and other manuscripts and what happened to them. And then, um, and then uh, the Omari scholars never address who gave Quran, uh, Uthman the authority to burn down these Qurans who were compiled by Sahaba. And according to them, Allah had sent down seven versions. At any rate, then uh, the ikhtilaf of Qira'a is that Uthman, when he burned down all other manuscripts of Quran, he kept one manuscript. And he made copies, seven copies, and sent them to seven different regions. And then, and those, and those, those um, copies obviously have been lost. We don't have them. So different people read that, that, that manuscript of Uthman differently. So either Uthman, when they were copying down from that, that one copy, seven other copies, they made mistakes. So they did not jive in. Or... Later on, because those copies were lost, people were reciting them differently. So there are differences. There are more than 14 different qira'a uh, or even more than that. And there are um, just differences. There are disputes that how these mm -hmm. verses should be, these verses in these words should be uh, recited. And some of them are differences in wording. Some of them are differences in dialect and pronunciation. So that is Qira, okay? Okay, but how do we know which one is like the correct one? You know, like how people say- no, there's, like there's no way to determine. Different. There is no way. There is no way to determine which one is correct one. So Ahlul Bayt alayhim salatu wasalam have said the correct one is the one Amirul Mu'mineen alayhi salam has compiled. And there's a time will come when that will, well, that, that will be ex, uh, exposed to you, but a time has not come yet. So right now, all of them are correct. Which, all of them are hujjah. So, all of them are hujjah. Yeah. Any, 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 oh. any qira is good. Yeah. But of course, there's, there, there's, there, there's difference between them. Allah has not sent all of them. And Uthman, Uthman had only one copy. So, so which one um, conforms to the copy of Uthman? And which one is valid one? We do not know that. But we know that they, all of them cannot oh. be correct. But they are all hujjah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, brother. All right, we have a caller from Canada. Canada, go ahead, please. Salaamu Alaikum. Wa Alaikum Salaam, Sheikh. How are you doing? Good. Who is calling? This is uh, Ali Abbas. I'm calling from uh, Texas. Texas. Okay. What's happening? So I had a question. Um, you know, I was just uh, going back and forth with someone. Um, in the comment section on a different clip, but uh, he made the claim that um, the Kawarij, uh, the ones who broke away from Imam Ali, alayhi salam, and Sifin, he's saying that, well, those same Kawarij fought alongside Imam Ali and Jamal, but he also said that those same Kawarij are the ones that murdered Osman. So is, it, is there like a trap? Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's true. Osman? Yeah. Yeah, a lot of those Khawarij, a lot of, okay. not all of them, a lot of those Khawarij participated in the murder of Uthman. And people who participated in the murder of Uthman, not all of them became Khariji, okay? So some of them, a lot of these people who rebelled against Uthman, 
they later became followers of Imam Amirul Mu'mineen alayhi salam and then they split from Amirul Mu'mineen alayhi salam and then they became Khawarij. But not everybody who rebelled against Uthman became Khariji. Okay? Sure. So then they, then they build on that by saying that um, the, like the claim of uh, Mawiyah was uh, correct that Imam Ali was protecting the murderers of Uthman. So, so and, then, and stuff uh, like so, that. Uh, the murders yeah, of no, Uthman, <laughs> yeah. So, well, so, is, so, think, so, but, but it didn't legitimize. See, so, uh, but that wouldn't warrant rebellion against Amirul Mu'minin alayhi salam. So, Uth no, definitely not. But you know, okay, Mu'aw uh, Hold on, Muawiyah was not was yeah. not. Well, he didn't have any claim to the blood of Uthman. There was nothing. Muawiyah was not his son. In Islam, if you are claiming uh, Isas, you are claiming blood uh, blood for blood, you have to be related to the person. You have to be his son. And the sons of Uthman were there. So, but it did not warrant a rebellion against Amir al Mu'minin. If, if Uthman's family, and among them Muawiyah, because they were far cousins, not close cousins, they believed Uthman was killed um, innocently, they is. They should have come to Amir al-Mu'minin alayhi salam. And they should have accused individuals to bring charges against the individuals. This, this, this. Because not 1,000 people did not kill Uthman. People who killed Uthman were very few. Two, three people. He was an old man in his 80s. So how many people do you think he killed him? They killed the people who killed Uthman. They were you know, people who were directly involved in his murder. They who sp spilled his blood. Who, who slit his throat. Those people stabbed him. Those are a couple individuals, right? And they were not Khariji. They never became Khariji. One was Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr. The other one was Amr ibn al-Hamq al, al And he was a Sahabi. He never became a, 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 a Khariji. So they should have brought their case before Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu was salam and said, okay, Uthman, did Uthman deserve to die or did not deserve to die? And they did not want to do that. And that was for many reasons. One, because if any case was brought in a court for the murder of Uthman, it would have been proven that Uthman deserved to die. That, would have, they were, that was the first reason. That they never, the sons of Uthman, the family of Uthman, did not file a case of charges against the murderers of Uthman in court of law. Why? Because they knew very well that this was a very popular uprise against Uthman. Uthman and Uthman's deeds were such because Uthman conspired to kill people and he and all the transgression in Baytul Mal and everything else that if any case was brought then it would be proved in case that Uthman had such character that all Sahaba they had agreed or Aisha had given fatwa that Uthman should be murdered so they had no chance in that way and second they didn't care about who killed Uthman. Muawiyah did not care about who killed Uthman. Muawiyah wanted Uthman to be killed, as a matter of fact. Because when Muawiyah, when Uthman was surrounded in his house, he was surrounded for months. And Damascus is not very far. And he's the caliph. He sent uh, letters, many letters, entreating Muawiyah to come and help him, to come and rescue him, send an army. Muawiyah never helped, helped Uthman when he was alive. His army came close to Medina, never entered Medina because they wanted Uthman to be killed because he knew if Uthman becomes ki uh, is killed, then there will be a chance for Muawiyah to become a caliph. And that's exactly what he wanted. So after Uthman was killed, Muawiyah, Muawiyah was raising the issue of Uthman's, Uthman's murder, not because he, he was really grieved by Uthman's murder, because there was no other reason for him to rally people against Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. Because he, did, he knew if he agreed that Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam is caliph, Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam had already dismissed uh, Muawiyah as governor of Syria. You understand? So he did not want to leave his governorship, which was in, in itself that governorship of that province was a kingdom. He did not want to leave it. So he didn't have any other, any other excuse except to to make uh, to make uh, uh, the story of Uthman's murder his battle cry in order not to submit to the rule of Amir al Mu'minin alayhi salatu wasalam. Okay. 
Understood. And then just to, and uh, and who was who that, was uh, um, uh, who was the prime minister of Uthman? Prime minister of Uthman is Marwan ibn al Hakam. Marwan ibn al Hakam is Sahabi. He's a narrator in Bukhari. Marwan ibn al Hakam himself. Uh, Marwan ibn al Hakam himself. Let me show you that he that he killed Talha. Talha as in order to avenge the murder of Uthman in the Battle of Jamal. You know, you understand, in the Battle of Jamal, commander-in-chief was Aisha. And then one commander, one of the generals was Zubair, one general was Talha. And who killed Talha? Talha and Zubair both were killed. But who killed Talha? This is Al-Kitab Al-Musannaf Al-Ahadith Wal-Athar Libna Abi Shayb Al-Kufi. Look, this hadith, this hadith number 60, this is valid. On the chart of Bukhari and Muslim. Haddathana Abu Usama, Haddathana Ismail, Haddathana Qais, Anna Qala Rama Marwanu Talhata Yawm Al-Jamal Bisahmin Fi Rakabatihi Famata Fadafannahu Ala Shati Al-Kalla. Marwan, who was in the army of Aisha, he assassinated. He threw an arrow at Talha in Talha. And this is a hadith that's sahih on the chart of Muslim. Of Muslim. And, uh, and volume number six of the same book, page number 190, the same narrators who are on the, as I said, uh, narrators of Bukhari, Kana Marwan Ma'a Talha Yawm Al Jamal. Marwan and Talha were together in the army of Aisha on the day of Jamal. When battle started, he is the cousin, Marwan is the cousin of Uthman and closer to Uthman than Muawiyah. And he is his son-in-law and he was his prime minister and treasurer and his commander-in-chief. He was the closest person to, to Uthman. He said, after today, I'm not going to seek vengeance for the blood of Uthman. Then he, he shot an arrow and he killed, uh, killed Talha. That's it. That's clearly. Who killed Uthman? Who killed Uthman? Yes, there are individuals who rebelled, rebelled against Uthman and they later joined Amir al Mu'minin alayhi salam. But those, but who actually commanded them to kill Uthman? It was Talha and Zubair. And who gave the fatwa to kill Uthman? It was Aisha. And who stabbed Uthman? It was a Sahabi, Amr ibn al Hamq al Khuzai. Okay? Thank you. Now give a chance to others Thank to you, ask Shaykh. a question. Thank All right? You so much. May Allah bless you. May Allah bless Thank you. you. Thank you, Shaykh. Okay. Salamun alaikum. Go ahead, please. Pakistan, go ahead, please. Yeah. What's up, what's up, caller? Go ahead, please. Yeah. Yes, yes. I am Hamza Rafiq from Pakistan, Gujranwala. Yes, Hamza Rafiq. What's going on? Uh, well, I I belong to Ahl al Hadith. Okay. Maslak. All right. Uh, I I want to talk with you. Uh, from I want to talk. Uh, my English is not very well. Okay. Uh, uh, in in speech in. Uh, while speaking in English, I uh, I I take uh, I took step uh, in Urdu. Okay. Okay. This, this is an English so, program. Please, please, I know. Uh, I know. Yeah, I, know. I, I right. know. Yeah. Thank you. I know. I I I, I will try my best. I sure, sure. my English is not very well. Okay. No problem. Yeah. I ask you. I ask your question. Uh, who is a, who? Uh, uh, according to Quran and Sunnah, who is Ahle Bayt? Ahlul Bayt, uh, uh, who? Uh, yeah. uh, Ahlul Bayt, Quran and Sunnah. I show you. Yeah. I show you from Quran and Sunnah. Okay. Allah Ta'ala and Quran and Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam in his Sunnah, they clearly yeah. establish and they clearly identify who are Ahlul Bayt. This is Sahih Muslim. Yeah. Gee, this is Sahih Muslim. Uh, oh, sorry. Sahih Muslim. Published by Darul Fikr in Beirut, Lebanon, at year 2010. 
Okay, here is the book of Fadail of Ali ibn Abi Talib in alayhi salatu was salam, page number 1198. This is hadith number 2404 on the authority of Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas. Lamma nazalat hadhi al-aya faqul ta'ala unnadu abna'ana wa abna'akum. When this verse was revealed, uh, in Ali Imran, verse number 93. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فمن حاجك فيه من بعد ما جاءك من العلم فقل تعالى وندع أبناءنا وأبناءكم O Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم Tell the Christians of the locality of Nijran Go ahead and bring forth your children and we will bring forth our children, our sons ونساءنا ونساءكم and you bring forth your women folk and we will bring forth our women folk وأنفسنا وأنفسكم. and you will bring forth those who are indeed like you and we will bring indeed those who are like us like our nafs so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to call upon and bring into public in front of all of the eyes in order to show a miracle today that after muhajjah, after argument and debate and a scholarly demonstration and uh, conversation, it was not established. This And the n n Christians of Nijran, they were not satisfied that Jesus, the son of Mary, is not the son of God. So now this should be established through mubahila, through miracle. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is promising the Muslim world and the people of Arabia at the time, that it would be the greatest spectacle of all time. In the fields of Medina today, there will be miracles worked by the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he is, he is commanded to bring with him his sons, his women, and that person who is just like him. And the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Sa'ad says, Sa'ad ibn Malik, who is called also Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, said فَدَعَى رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَالِهِ عَلِيًّا وَفَاطِمَةَ وَحَسَنًا وَحُسَيْنًا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَالِهِ وَسَلَّمْ brought with him and he called upon these individuals Ali alayhi salam Hassan alayhi salam Hussein alayhi salam and Fatima al-Zahra salam Allahi alayhi and then after he called them he said Allahumma O my Lord O my Creator هَأُولَاءِ أَهْلِ these are my Ahl Bayt these are my Ahl Bayt so this is Quran, this is Sunnah, and this is Sahih Muslim. Per Quran's command, per Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Sunnah, from your most authentic book, it's established that the Ahlul Bayt, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had nine wives. Right, nine wives. They, were, they wouldn't have disliked to come with the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It would have been a great honor for them. But in order to work miracles today, they would be also present there. But the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not bring them forth. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not a person who would uh, violate Allah's, Allah's uh, command. If Allah has asked him to bring his women folk, he defies Allah and he brings only Fatima al-Zahra. So he knows what Allah means, who he knows who is Ahlul Bayt is, and he practically and verbally Demonstrates for the for the history for the whole posterity to witness and remember who is Ahlul Bayt is okay Sufi Sab yes yes uh, 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 listen to me listen to me yeah uh, Asana la Yari Sab Min Haisul Jamaat we accept Min Haisul Jamaat Ahlul Hadith we accept Sayyidna Sayyidna Hassan or Hassan Hassan or Sayyidna Hussein. رضوان الله عليه مجمعين وسيدة فاطمة الزهرة سلام الله عليها أهل البيت we accept we accept so so if Aisha and Hafsa and these people were Ahlul Bayt the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would have brought him would have brought them yes when, yes yes, when, uh, when, yes uh, because uh, Allah uh, says ونساءنا ونساءكم Allah said bring your women yes. why you didn't bring them yeah. why you didn't bring them yes. tell me Yes, uh, listen to me. Uh, our concept, uh, uh, first number, uh, Ahlul Bayt, uh, 
wife the second so why he didn't bring them Doctor. He should have brought them and said, Allahumma oh, haula ahli. Listen, listen, listen. Why he didn't yes. bring Aisha I, and Hafsa accept, and Sauda and Zainab and I say, oh, Allahumma haula ahli. I, I accept, I accept. I believe, I believe this hadith. I, uh, uh, tell me the answer. Uh, tell me the question. answer. Uh, yeah. uh, yes. <laughs> tell me uh, Surat Hud. I... I yeah. I, I read Surah so, Hud. So she I is she, uh, Sara. Ta'ajabina yes. min amrillah. Yes, yes. Sara, yes, Sara yes, is yes, someone. Yes, yes. Look, Sara is someone yes. who in the Surah Hud, she converses with angels. She addresses the angels and addresses the angel address her. So she yes, has, yes, at, yes. at that level of purity. If a woman is at that level of purity, that angels talk to her. Then she is from yes, Ahlul Bayt yes. of Ibrahim. She is from Ahlul Bayt yes, of Ibrahim, yes, yes. right? But yes, yes, yes. Did Aisha one day talk to angels? No, no. No, that's it. So, so yes. Aisha that, is in order to be from Ahl al-Bayt al nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Let me show you. So he is arguing from the, uh, this verse is not about, 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 uh, about, um, Ahl al-Bayt of our Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This verse is about the um, family of Ibrahim, Ibrahim alayhi salam. Look. Uh, Surah Tuhud. وَمْرَأَةَهُ قَائِمَةٌ فَضَحِكَتْ His wife, Abraham's wife alayhi salam. His wife was standing, فَضَحِكَتْ She she laughed. We gave her the angels. Allah gave her the glad tiding of Ishaq and after Ishaq Yaqub. So she sees the angels. She laughs with angels. She hears angels. Allah directs his revelation unto her. So she is someone who converses with, with them. So she is at that level of purity. At that level of piety and sanctity that she sees angels and talks with angels. And plus, this is not, we are not talking about. We are not talking about the house of our Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We are talking about the house of Ibrahim Alayhi Wasallam. And in this occasion, we could also mention, say that Ahl al-Bayt means people in the house. Literally, the building. The building, this building. House of Ibrahim, this building. But a Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his bayt does not mean the building. His bayt does not mean the building. And there are many, 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 many reasons for that. And he says Ahl al-Bayt. Because in his house, there also were his servants. Does anybody say the, they lived in the house? They lived in the house. Anybody who resides in the house, he is a person of that house. If we mean the house is, house is what? House is, uh, house is the building. His servants, his slaves, they were not the people of the house. And then the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when Ayat al-Tathir came, he always put, put the under the cloak, the five individuals under, under the cloak, under the blanket, right? And why would he do that? Why would he do that? If it was just the house, okay, Aisha is there, Hafsa, Hafsa is there, Umm Salama is there. Why? So the verse is also for the people in the house. And these individuals, Aisha, Hafsa, they are already in the house. Why exclude them? Right? By Bringing Panjtani Park, the Khamsa at the five pure ones under the cloak. Okay. Let me take a call from the US. All right. Salam alaikum. Who is with me? Who's the caller? Salam alaikum. Hello. Can you hear me? Hello. Who is it? Yes, brother. Oh, no. Oh, fine. Oh, hello. My name is Victor. Um, I live in San Diego. And um, yep. I was once a, I was once a Sunni, uh, yeah. a Salafi, but um, I reverted back to Shiitism. All right. I found out it makes more makes more sense to me, to be honest. 
Okay, uh, good, good to hear I'd that. I'd rather follow the Ali's and the 14 infallibles than believe in the, uh, the humiliated and apathetic caliphs. I think they were kind of corrupt. Good for you. How um, old are you, Victor? I'm 40. So I was All right, man, love bless you. Ago. Yeah. I was ready two years, two years ago uh, with the Salafis, but then... Um, you know what's weird with the Salafis? If you mention Imam Ali and say Allah Salam and say Imam Ali, they get upset. Or if you say Al Hassan, Al Hassan, Allah Salam, they get upset. I of know course. that was the of course, thing. of course. Yeah. Although so in Bukhari and Bukhari and Muslim, it's always Alayhi Salam. You know that, right? In Bukhari yeah. and Muslim, it's always uh, Alayhi Salam. Yeah. So um, that was the contention I had. So um, I actually left them when the Afghanistan and uh, the Taliban and all that, because I thought they were wrong. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they were supporting the Taliban and stuff like of that. Course. But I noticed of course. Uh, the, persecu the persecution of the Shias. Mm -hmm. um, and then I Google, um, my partner is actually Iranian. So um, okay. he kind of brought me back to Islam. And okay. so then um, that's where I'm at right now. Okay, um, Mel, I'm I'm glad to have heard your story. Yeah. Do I have to say my shahada again? Or how does that work out? Do you have to say your shahada again? No. You 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 believe in Allah and you believe in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. All you have to do is also give testimony to the Imama of the twelve Imams alayhi wa sallam. Okay. Yeah. And my other question is for English people, and like I live in San Diego, so uh -huh. where do we find Shiite books like in English? Like where is so the best in English? Word in English, there are, there are many. There are not. I don't. I don't think there's any physical library that you go and pick up books. But there are lots of things online. Mm -hmm. There are lots of resources, and obviously, mm -hmm. all books are not the same. Some books are better than the others. Some books are garbage. Some books are good. Some books are excellent. But um, there are many websites that uh, offer uh, good, uh, good Shia books in English. Amongst them, alislam.org. Al Islam. I think oh, yeah, there's a there's a hyphen, yeah, hyphen between al and Islam.org. You find some good some books there, and obviously there's lots of books there. Not all of the books are 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 of the same quality. Yeah. And I also found a web, couple websites that you could download Shia books, and I've been reading those. You know. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. um, but, okay, there's only, in San Diego County, the only uh, Shiite mosque I could find was in, like, uh, Santee or something like that. There um, is a mosque in Santee, that's correct. There? Yeah, there's a mosque in Santee. That's but, actually Lakeside, in Lakeside. And that's, yeah. and that's it for San Diego County, right? That's Lakeside to San Diego County, of course. After Santee, the, Santee there's Lakeside, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, like, okay. Because most of the masses are all like, a lot of them are Salafi, actually, to be honest. A lot of them are. Well, um, I, yeah, that's right. That's, that's the case. Okay, Victor. I have a you question. Have a, yeah, what's the question? Oh, one last question. Well, one last question. Yes, brother. Uh, why, while we're in uh, amongst other Muslims, is, do you find yourself ever hiding your beliefs, or? Um, yeah, if 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 you are amongst other Muslims and you fear retribution, abuse, or even disrespect, mm -hmm. so it's not and yeah. uh, and pronouncing your belief doesn't serve any purpose. If, there, if it serves a purpose, if you're going to guide someone or you are going to prevent a mischief or an abuse, that's another case. But if you're just somewhere, somewhere and you know if they know who you are, what you believe in, they'll, they're going to disrespect you or abuse you or beat you up or even kill you or, cut, or you lose your job, they will do something that you will be fired. Or they will conspire mm -hmm. against you in another way. There's no need. There's no need to create problems for you. Ahlul Bayt alayhim salatu wasalam have commanded us in such situations. Just do mm -hmm. the best thing, uh, sensible thing there is. Just, just do, do not, do not make your, for yourself enemies. That and yeah. 
uh, and do not uh, yeah, make yourself the target of other people's opposition and harassment and hide your beliefs in the, such a situation. But, but there are occasions that you have to make a stand. You have to take a stand and you have to declare what is right. And those situations are obviously different, right? It, de it depends on, on your situation and where you are and who those people are, right? Okay. Okay, brother. Thank you. You have a good evening. All right. All right. You too. Bye. Okay. Goodbye. Salamu alaikum. Who is with me? Hello. Hello, Janab. Yes, India. Go ahead. Hello. Salamu alaikum, sir. Alaikum assalam. Good morning. What's happening? Uh, I'm Ali Abuzer speaking from India, Nagpur. Yeah. Ali Abuzer Haidri. Yes, yeah. brother. Uh, actually, Sheikh, I have uh, one question. Uh, yeah. Some some of uh, some people in our Shia community says mm -hmm. that we should not curse the personality of the Jamaat Umariya even wow. in our private gathering. And the reason they say is that uh, because it will become a practice and Shia gets diverted from the actual teaching of El Ulbet. So, so, that, the, uh, so that is the, actually that is the actual teaching of Ahl al-Bayt to be the enemies of okay. Ahl al-Bayt to be the enemy of enemies of Ahl al-Bayt right? Okay, okay. Yeah, and yeah. one thing, and to one do thing, bara, and to, to do bara'a is a teaching of Ahl al-Bayt alayhim as salam. And that, uh, so to, to, the, to not to show respect for criminals. And that's, a, that's something it, that, that's a matter of common sense, a matter of uh, clear conscience and integrity indicates that not to disrespect people who are criminals. I'm sorry, not to respect, it, not to venerate, and to call criminals okay. criminals. Yeah, people who are and vicious the, criminals. Yeah, just call them that. Mm -hmm. Now, now, as I mentioned, the earlier call called me. If it causes a mischief, it causes a problem. Then, of course, you shouldn't have to, shouldn't do that. But in private, it's obligatory. Bara uh, yeah. from uh, it, enemies of Ahl al-Bayt, alayhim as salatu was salam, is obligatory. Okay, it's compulsory. And yeah. and one thing, yeah. one more thing. And, the, and it, they say okay. that. Yeah, yeah. They, they say, say that. What? Lanat, lanat means when you don't have answer to convince your opponent and you don't have a proof, then you, uh, no, then you then do the lanat. Allah has done lana. Allah has Is done lana right? numerous times in the Quran, right? Allah doesn't have answer. Uh, sorry, any, any any they have the, oh, reference. You want, you want a reference for lana? Just do a Google search. Lana in Quran. And you will see it. Okay. Pakistan. Salamu alaikum. Who is with me? Okay, this guy's disconnected, I think. Okay, it's been a good two hours. Thank you so much. May Allah bless you all. All right, we have a caller here. Go ahead. Salaamu Alaikum. Who is with me? Alaikum Assalam. Hello, sir. I'm Amir. I mean, what's happening? Where are you calling from? Uh, good, good, Alhamdulillah. From Canada. Canada, what's happening? Uh, good, Alhamdulillah. Uh, excuse me, sir. Uh, I've got a question, if possible. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. If, if someone in high school gets some marks, uh, <laughs> why cheating? Well, if, if you then, cheat in uh, high school, you should, if you cheat in high school, yeah. Well, you oh, should just, <laughs> yeah, if you cheat in high school and your grades and your, in your exams. So if, um, okay. so you should, it's, it, it's if it, cheating. See if, if you, what's, what's, what's forbidden is lying, lying. Okay. If you lie to someone, if you, that, that's, that's forbidden. But if there is an exam and no, if you're not lying and you want to look up the answer in your phone book, uh, in your telephone or somewhere and write it down, if it does not entail lying and if it does not uh, lead you to abuse another person's right, for instance, the, fir the person who has the best marks, he will get a hundred dollars reward, right? If I cheat myself my way up there to get that reward, that respect, then obviously I've abused another person because I've, I've cheated him. Right, and uh, one is not allowed to cheat even against a non-Muslim. It doesn't matter, Christian, Jewish, black, white, doesn't matter, or even animals. 
transgression and oh, abuse yeah. of even animals is not a lot permissible. So let alone another human being. So if if it's if that is not the case, if these two cases happen, then you cannot cheat. But if that if 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 that's not the case, right? You're not going to lie to anyone. Nobody is going to ask you if you cheated or not. If they ask you, you cheated, then you have to tell the truth. Yeah, you cheated, but they're not going to ask you that. So you're just going to look up the answer in your phone, in your t mobile phone, and then you're going to write it down. And you're not going to Isn't abuse there... anyone, so because you're not going to get those grades that you know that will be a transgression on another person. There, there's religiously, religiously, this of course this is a violation, violation of uh, college or high school laws, but it's not a violation of religious law. Uh, unless, yes, unless, example, unless, unless this is called, unless, unless it's called, it's called, you know, transgression or, or deception in some way, but which would, could be that that's forbidden. Okay. At any rate, it's, you uh, have to yes, do with uh, repentance. Me, okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. At any oh, rate, uh, sorry, that will be, that will be perhaps because it's a deception, a trickery. Not every kind of deception is forbidden religiously, right? But um, a deception that involves lying, a deception that involves abuse another, of another person. Uh, I, it's, it's not in my mind why it would be haram right now, why it would be forbidden, why it would be a sin, right? If it doesn't involve che uh, lying or, lying or uh, abusing another person's right. Okay? I cannot think of any reason right now. Maybe there is, but... But I, but at any rate, you can do istighfar. Assalamu alaikum. Go ahead, please. Assalamu alaikum. How are you? Good. Who's calling? I think my name is Ali. I'm calling from Hamilton, Ontario. Uh, Ontario. Before, yeah. Uh, mashallah, mashallah. You, I've seen you defend the yellow bed for seven or eight every Saturday or Friday. Mashallah. That's, that's, that's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. Sure. Um, Thank you. Um, uh, I just, uh, had uh, one question regarding uh, um, you. You mentioned that Mola Ali had turned a human being alive. Uh, I think it's in Sunni references and also in Shia references that he had turned a human being alive. Um, now I, I was a bit confused with that because, uh, of course, we know that Mola Ali's a talk is a talk. So is is this something which is true or is it is it a mystery? What is true? I don't understand. Um, Mawla Ali al -Islam did what? Uh, uh, burning that human being alive with not even body. Oh, he didn't burn him alive. Amir al-Mu'mineen al what he did, because these persons, what they were claiming, that Amir al-Mu'mineen is a, a god or in the creator. So what he did, is he dug one hole and he dug another hole. He, he um, created fire in one hole in such a way that the smoke will go to the other pit. And anybody who's in the other pit, he would suffocate gradually. So in order to force them to repent, in order to force them to turn away from their false beliefs, he put he 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 condemned them to die by suffocation by smoke. If these individuals have turned against their their dogma, their belief, and they said, "Okay, you are not God," Amirul Mu'minin Ali would have brought them out. So it was for them to give them a chance that their death is certain, that they will die. If it have I mean, Ramon has given them a quick death, for instance, by a sword or hanging them, these sword that you die inst instantly, uh, then uh, they did not have a chance to turn uh, to do repentance. So Amir al Mu'minin gave them the chance, but so because if you are suffocating by smoke, it takes you a while. It takes you 10, 20, 30 minutes. So they had a chance. So, but they didn't. They didn't want. They didn't want to repent. They didn't want to accept the truth. So Amir al salam said, I'm not God, I'm not the creator, I didn't create you. I'm not, I'm not, I'm just, I'm just a servant of Allah. I, uh, Allah is the one who has created the heavens and the earth. I'm not him. But they did not want to turn away from their beliefs. They did not want to abandon and disavow their kufr. So that was a way to give them, it seems to me, to give them chance to, to, to live. And it was very easy for the, for these individuals to live. Just disavow their belief, but they didn't do that. So, but Amir al-Mu'mineen al did not burn them alive. Okay? Thank you so much. 
Okay? Thank you. Okay. Alaykum salam. Okay, I'll take the last call and then um, that's it. Australia, go ahead, please. Australia. Salam alaikum. Alaikum What's happening? This is, uh, this is uh, Sayyid Qasim. I'm actually not in Australia. I am uh, near Australia in an island called Bonio Island. Okay. It's the same island where the Brunei is. So if you allow me to ask some of the questions, it might not be related to today's topic. Okay. But uh, my roots are Pakistani. I was born and lived in Pakistan for a bit. And as far as I have seen you, I have seen six years ago as well, you are doing an immense job for Ahli Bata uh, Salaam. Thank you. May Allah Ta'ala give you an immense reward for that. So, thank you. Uh, my first question is regarding human in space age. Okay. Uh, because as far as I think, future generations are going to question about this. And are we ready for answers with Quran and Hadith and uh, Hadith of Masumi? So humans are in space age. There are trillions of planets, billions of stars, millions of galaxies. We have mm. Iman on 124,000, almost. Okay. And okay. it's the slightest, slightest possibility that Nabuat was on other planets. We have already Nubu established the Quran. Nabuat yes, was what? Was established on other planets. But it was what they be on other planets. Who says there are people there in the other planets? We have never seen. Living we have never seen. But at the same time, yes, but Quran also know. said that. Well, we don't know. God you know, if you're other talking about other, other planets, look, the, what, what, what's in our solar system is accessible that the human being in his natural life could pro possibly. It has not happened so far, but it possibly a human being could travel as Mars and Mars could be perhaps one day colonized. And that's very far fetched. And maybe it will happen. Maybe it will not happen in our lifetime. But if you are talking about the other planets right. outside our solar system, you know, those, those planets are billions of light years away. True. So there's no way there's no way we, you, human beings are going there. If we go there with okay. billions of years to get, not billion trillions of years. Because we cannot travel at the speed of light. Our speed would be a lot slower True. than the speed of light. So how is human being going to go there? So that's, that question is mute. Okay. Now, we don't, no, no, we, in, our hadith, okay. in our hadith, we have narrations about other worlds. The Ayma alayhi salam have said yeah. other worlds. Yeah. Thousands of, yeah. thousands of worlds like ours. Not one. Thousands of worlds like that yeah. ours. And Imam yeah. alayhi have said that we are imams there. That we, they, they, those people of those worlds, they follow us and they curse, they curse the usurpers of uh, Fadak. Okay, a hadith to that. And now those yes, worlds. That, that are, yeah. and now that those worlds are in these planets, in this soul, and in, in this galaxy, or that's another dimension. Who knows? They, they have, yeah. that, that has yeah. not been explained in hadith. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Okay, so the next question would be the offshoot of the same answer that you've given me. So the 124,000 would be on this earth. Would you agree? Yeah, those are, those 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 apostles that we are talking Quran, they are for the yeah. children of Adam. They are children of Adam, Adam. have lived on earth. Yeah, on all earth. Right, all right. Yeah. Now right. other planets, uh, children of Adam have not. Yeah, you know, as far as we know, have not. Uh, uh, Maybe they, through miracles or apostles, may have gone, but but children of Adam have not gone to other planets. We know that for a fact. For a fact, okay. Yeah. Uh, we also know for a fact that uh, this Earth. We have plenty of evidences that this Earth has been destroyed four times, completely all over and over again in past millions of years. Uh, one mm -hmm. of those times was uh, Hazrat Nu is not one of those times. Hazrat Nu is. Uh, is these times that the times where we end? Uh, so uh, Earth getting destroyed four times over and over again, destruction, total utter destruction, and the creation started all over again. Uh, uh, like Atlantis, they say this one of probably one of those. Uh, you you uh, watch too many uh, wacky shows, brother. 
<laughs> no, I, I am not talking okay. about lucky shoes. I'm talking about from from a lot of. Uh, okay. Uh, all right. Then, proven, now proven we're going things. to. All right. I, I, that's not my area of expertise. As far uh, as the history okay, of the because world it, goes, it has been confusing okay. me uh, yeah. that uh, but all of these these things saying in again and again. So, hundred. My question is actually sorry. My question is hundred and twenty four thousand. Such a big number. So, if there is a possibility that hundred and twenty four thousand are from Adam or from the the first destruction that happened, and then oh, no. all so, over it started. So the, Earth Earth is very very old. According to yes. Quran and Sunnah, it's not six thousand yes. years old. It's very, very old. It's millions, and they, millions. And, and Adam, Adam, Adam is something new on Earth, and Adam's descendants are new on Earth. Before Adam, alayhi salam, there were other people on Earth, and they were, and before they were called nasnas, -nas, and bef there were other creatures on Earth, and they worshipped Allah subhanahu right. wa taala. They had culture, they spoke, they talked, and that could be. It's it's not. I I do not. Uh, Cannot confirm this uh, with certainty, but I give it a probability that anthropologists talk about um, Neanderthals, the Neanderthals who are genetically not human yes. beings, but they are very similar yeah. to the human beings. So, true, uh, true. so, so, so it's um, the, in our in our hadith, it's been mentioned often that uh, from Amir al muminin alayhi salatu wasalam that history of Earth is very goes back very far and there were many many other creatures before the human being on earth so and they worshiped allah some of them did not worship allah so uh so and they had different names and they some of them are very uh very rigid and they bloodthirsty and they killed each other so i would say that yeah. perhaps they refer to neanderthals or perhaps some other creatures that have that we do not know about right Yes, um, that would I mean, that be intelligent. I've, that I've would be heard. intelligent. That would be intelligent. That would have a speech like us. But they yes. are not. We, we are not descended from them. So we could be we could be similar, but we are not descended from them. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the hundred and twenty-four thousand is it from Adam between us and Adam? Uh, apparently that's the case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, we are talking about they, the they of born... Adam. Yeah. Yes, children of Adam. So that won't be the ones that before or Neanderthals, whatever. It's like before yeah. destruction, or there's yeah, another that, race that, somewhere that, living. That, those about those we do not know the details. How Allah guided them and what were their tests, and how we just know the number. They, yeah, yeah, we do not know much about them. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, then uh, something about what is happening around me. I live in a city in a country where no one is allowed to pray the way she Ali ibn Abi Talib salam do. You can't open hands, you let alone do tabarrah. So how do you consider the person in my position Where? to reply Where? to in someone? Australia? In... In no, Australia? No, I'm Island? not in Australia. I'm not, I'm not in Australia. I'm on the island of Borneo. So that, it's the that same island. island. They, uh, they don't allow you to pray? No, they pray, but they are Salafis and Wahhabis. The moment I go to the Eid for, for mosque when, during Eid, and I open my hand, so, they come and tell me to close my hands. So, so who says you have to go there if they don't if they don't tolerate tolerate you? Why you have to go? So, eat the mother eat. I must pray at home. You can pray individually. Yeah, you don't have to pray with them. Uh, eat, can I can do it like online with somebody else who's also doing it? Is it possible to do it through the phone? If you if you if you want two people want to pray together, be my guest. Do it. Yeah. Do it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that would be all well, now. The, the I, Wahhabis, I Wahhabis in Australia, in Australian islands, they're a minority. They're not the majority. No, they I am not in Australia. Yeah. I'm not in Australia. I'm not in Australia. But, I'm on the island. That island is part I'm of on Australia. I'm island where... That's a country... You are within the country of Australia or no? No, no, I'm not. Oh, I'm on the same island. Yeah. Okay, you're on a different country. I'm on an okay. island. Let me explain okay. to you one second. I'm on an island with Brunei is, but not, I mean, not in Brunei. Brunei. I'm a neighbor Brunei. of Brunei. I'm a okay. neighbor so, of Brunei. So why you say, why are you saying, uh, why did you mention Australia then? You should have, you have mentioned, no. you should have mentioned Malaysia. No, I, I haven't mentioned Australia. They figured out because the code number is almost similar. It's 661 oh, okay. and 60. So they okay. probably, I never mentioned Australia. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's uh, what confused me. Okay. Yeah. At any rate, at yeah. any rate, you don't have to go to there. If, if they don't tolerate you, don't go. 
You, who, who is forcing you to go? You're living in an age so, of secular, secularism. So that's a blessing for you because nobody could force okay. you to worship in their way. Okay. You can worship the way you want. As long they as you don't go to the mosque. Their own Sharia if law. I, if I the go, Sharia law is so different. Yeah. Yeah, if I go, if I go, for instance, into a Christian church, I cannot go there and disrupt their their rituals, right? That would be that will not that yes. be disrespectful for me. I'm a Muslim. I go there to disrupt yeah. their rituals, and I want to pray my own way. Yeah. That, that's that's yeah. not that's not respect to them. So I I will if I want to pray my own way, I'm not. I will I can pray. So I'm not going to disrupt them. Same way for you. If you are Wahhabi yes. brothers, they want to pray a certain way. They don't want you you to be a mole in their eyes. So, so yes. respect them and respect yourself and don't go. Okay, thank you. That's the I'll thing. take the next call. Okay, may Allah bless you. All right, who is that? Who is that? Salam alaikum. Go ahead, please. Wa alaikum salam, sir. This is Muhammad Suhail from Pakistan. Yeah, Muhammad Suhail. Sir, I have a certain question I want to ask you. What's happening? What's the question? Sir, uh, it is about uh, uh, Imam. Sir, is it possible that uh, new things uh, being added in Islam after the Prophet Muhammad uh, yeah, during the Yeah, it's possible. It's it's happening right now. <laughs> Adding new things. <laughs> that's that's what. That, how difficult could that be, right? So, uh, is it good to add new things uh, because it's not, good. They, uh, it's not good? It's not good to to lie and fabricate. Okay. No, no, because I'm not you, saying lying. Or... Yeah, that's lying because if you're adding something to Islam, you're saying it's part of Islam. Mm -hmm. And Islam is something that Allah sent. It's a message from the divine, right? It's a message from, from the Lord. And you are, it's something that the Lord didn't send. It's not part of his message. You are saying now it's part of his message. And that is lying. That's fabrication. That's innovation. That's bid'ah, okay? And that is prohibited. That's not allowed. If for anything, if this is, for instance, this is Shakespeare, forget about Islam. This is Shakespeare. This this Shakespeare wrote this play, and now I add a couple pages to it, and I say this is also Shakespeare. Is that a that, that an honest endeavor? That's a good thing. No, that's a lie. That's that's fabrication. That's adulterating Shakespeare's work. If this book is Edgar Allan Poe's poetry, and now I like this poem I wrote. And I'm not adding it to this. I'm saying poem. Uh, Poe also wrote this poem. And now the, one more page I added to the book, right? So what is that? That's terrible. Because Poe po didn't write that page. So I was the author. I should be honest. I should say this is Poe's work. And this, is, this, this page is mine. It's not Poe's. It's mine. I've written. If you agree to it, read it also. It's beautiful. Likewise. We sh nobody has the authority to add to anything, right? Even from a secular point of view, Islam is Islam is not just anything you make up. Islam is that message that the, our let's say I'm not Muslim. I would say Islam is that message that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he claimed that he has brought from Allah. What he has brought from Allah that is Islam. Now things that people have later added on that's not the teachings of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, right? Even if I was secular, that would be the honest thing to do, the honest thing to say. Anything that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because I love him, because I revere him, because I glorify him. But if I were secular, I wouldn't say that, right? But at any rate, if I were irreligious, I was secular, I was Christian, I was an atheist, the honest thing would be, okay, if anything, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he did not propagate, he did not teach and later on was added by people. Of, we, of, of course, that's not part of his teaching. That's Muslims, Muslim people's thought, right? So, so we have to be honest. Everything is like that. It's not only for Islam, for, for Shakespeare, for, for Edgar Allan Poe. Now, if you were, for instance, I'm reading this book, it's by President John F. Kennedy, JFK. Such a good writer, JFK. Uh, President JFK, who was killed in 1962. He had a very beautiful pen, a very good author. He has a book called, um, many, he has a, a, more than one book, a very intelligent person. Now, if I write an essay, 
and attribute it to JFK. <laughs> oh, but is that honest? No, that's, that's, that's a lying, that's fabrication. That's a very, very dishonest. That's treacherous. Now, if I, if I come up with an idea, I, I should say this is my thought. And I should present it to people as my thought. And if it's up to people, if it's good, they accept it. If they agree, they do not accept it. Right? Now, if I lie to people, and I say, Allah said this, Quran says this, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said this, then I'm, what am I? I'm a liar. I'm a fabricator. I'm, uh, I'm deceiving you. I'm misleading you. And that's uh, intellectually, ethically, that is, uh, that is wrong. And religiously, that's prohibited. Okay, okay, thank you so much. Calls are coming, but it's enough. And Wednesday, we have another show, right? On Wednesday, I'll be here with you on Wednesday at the same time. So we have English show twice a week. And inshallah, tabarak wa ta'ala, we'll take your calls on Wednesday. Until then, haydar, 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 haydar. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad, haydar. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Oh Allah, we besiege you for the sake of Muhammad and ali Muhammad. Forgive our sins. And bless us with good health and wealth and a happy ending in this life, inshallah, tabaraka wa ta'ala, and a glorious hereafter. O oh Allah, forgive our father's sins, our forefather's sins, our mother's sins, and our family's sins. And grant us the, the intercession of Ahlul Bayt, alayhim salam Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma ajjil li waliyyik al-faraj. Peace be unto all of you. Assalamu alaikum.